Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Well, you do realize I'm speaking tonight. Eric Stenzel, you don't have the wrong room. Okay, good. Well, brave souls. So tonight, uh, I want to welcome you to our Double Vision uh, exhibit. And it's a show that uh, Jim Disney and I talked about for years uh, doing together. Jim was an incredible painter, someone I admired greatly. I would look at his photo, at his paintings, and uh, say, I know exactly where that is. And I can feel exactly the type of data that that is in his life. And so I knew that he was someone who loved Rocky Mountain National Park, and so we built this friendship. And uh, it's funny, people would all often look at his paintings and say, those are photographs, aren't they? And when people look at my photographs and say, those are paintings, aren't they? And uh, he used to laugh at that and thought it was really funny, the difference and similarities between our different works of art. We both have a passion for Rocky Mountain National Park, but at the same time, uh, express that passion through very different mediums. Him with uh, uh, painting, starting with a blank canvas and slowly adding to it to create something, and me starting with a chaotic world and trying to simplify it down to express those same feelings and emotions. And so this show is just kind of playing with our two different mediums, uh, and I encourage you to spend some time looking around between the two. They had the, uh, the school kids the other day try to figure out which was a painting and which was a photograph. I think you can do that. <laughs> but it's playing with color and light and subject matter. So, But tonight I'm here to talk about uh, what's behind the photographs. You know, what's involved in taking these photographs. And also to give some, some of the stories about what my often crazy little life is, is like give you some insight. I'm going to talk for maybe 30 minutes. If you start passing out, uh, just wave your hand and we'll, we'll, we'll cut it short here before you collapse. And uh, then I'm going to open it for questions and let you just ask me anything. I'm an open book. I have nothing, nothing I'm not really willing to talk about. So uh, think of a doozy for me and uh, let's see if we can make this a fun, interesting night. I hope you find it entertaining. I hope you uh, uh, come away with a few thoughts as well. Well, uh, I became a photographer um, back in 2004 after having worked overseas in the Balkan Peninsula for over a decade. I got burned out. Wanted to find a way to refresh myself. And I knew that uh, the one place that I found restoration was in the mountains. There was something healing about being out in the wilderness by myself in silence and solitude. And so I thought, well, how in the world can I get paid to hike? <laughs> and that's how the journey started. And I uh, ended up deciding somebody takes those pretty pictures. I might as well be me. And so I then, once I made that decision, I went to our local library and started looking through books and paintings and said, wow, that one's incredible. That one moves me. How does it work? Where are the subjects at? Where is the light coming from? And then going out and trying to replicate it. And so I've spent almost 20 years now uh, photographing, and my primary subject is Rocky Mountain National Park. It's a place I know and love. I've explored just about every crack and crevice in that place. Um, and that's one of the things Jim and I show, the Yellow Mountains and the low valleys, and, and uh, something we was a common love. But I had to learn what photography was. And it's, uh, you know, I go to Rocky Mountain National Park, I spend a lot of time there. And I see people leaning out of the car window with their phone or with their uh, uh, cell phone, yeah, with their cell phone, with their camera, trying to get a picture. Some people actually step outside the car and uh, take a picture of the elk in the big scene in front of them in Lane Park. And a few people even wander around Bear Lake and uh, take some pictures. And then they stop in my gallery up in Essex Park and they go, hmm. My photos don't look like yours. You must have a really good camera. <laughs> I wonder if they did at the next restaurant they go to. They say, boy, you, what hands do you use to make this meal? It's delicious. Or go to a concert and ask the same thing. Oh, if I have that violin, I could do that. Um, but uh, you know, there's a lot more to it than uh, a fancy camera. A fancy camera helps. Uh, and then sometimes they say, oh, it's all about editing. Yeah, the, the camera and the editing are maybe 10 to 15 percent. 
So what does it take to get a photograph that grabs you, that stands out, that speaks to you? Uh, I'd say you could do it even without a fancy camera, without really much editing. So what are the main components that I'm now looking for? It's a series of, that, of things I'm trying to find in nature to create this, this image. And the first for every professional photographer, whether they're a nature photographer like me or do portraits, it's all about light. They, they're connoisseurs of light. Photography, light writing. It's, uh, photography is writing with light. And so we never take a photograph of an actual object. What we take photographs are is the light reflecting off of that object. And it's different throughout the day, every hour. Uh, it, even every few minutes, it can just change radically um, from a harsh and uh, contrasty scene that, that evokes no emotion to something that comes alive and, and, and excites you. And it's paying attention to those moves throughout the day that is that's of essential. It's essential. You know, uh, nature photographers are all very aware that the sun uh, moves through the sky throughout the year, rises and sets in different, different places, and um, that change of direction is going to change what happens in the wilderness. Uh, I know certain mountains, the Mummy Range, for instance, in Rocky Mountain National Park. I don't photograph in the summer. I get lots of people asking me for photographs of that range in the morning, in the summer, but it's in shade much of the morning until the light gets rather harsh. But in the winter, oh my goodness, it lights up gloriously because of that southerly sun. But nature photographers are also aware that when the sun rises high in the sky, as it rises, the color changes. If there are no clouds, when it first crests the horizon, the color is a deep red. Then it goes to an or reddish orange, orange, into the yellows, and then fades into sort of a, a neutral, or even sometimes a grayish light. And that, that can all happen within 10 minutes um, at certain times of year. It, it's a, and so they look at these images and they're full of color and they think, ah, oh, you must, it must all be Photoshop. But then I take the students out that I have in the past and they watch and they see, watch it all change and how quickly it changes. It's amazing. But I had someone come up to me in my gallery in my early years and look at a picture of Bob speak and said, I've lived up here for 60 years, and this is fake, because I have never seen Long's Peak Red. Okay, have you ever been out for a sunrise? Well. <laughs> but that's so photographers are connoisseurs of light. We pay attention. But we also watch the weather. One of the things you quickly learn is that if you go out into, out to take a photograph, and it's a blue sky day, you're all excited, your heart may be beating fast and thinking, wow, this is gorgeous. But you take a picture and it falls flat. It carries no emotion. For some reason, clouds are really oftentimes the emotion of a photograph. They carry that weight. And when they're lit to different, they're reflectors as well, shining the light back down onto the earth. And so often, if I wake up and it's a blue sky day, I'm either going to go back to bed or I'm going to go into the forest and find something in the shadow that I can work with. But photographers also know if you get into a, uh, a day where it's cloudy and overcast, I don't shoot the big landscapes. And they may look gorgeous, but they're not going to look great on a cloudy day. But you know what it does? Waterfalls, forest scenes, flowers, so many different things open up as possibilities to be photographed during that time of day. And it's just being aware of that. But another thing photographers keep an eye on is nature photographers. We're looking for vegetation. We're paying attention to how it's changing. You know, most uh, professional nature photographers are going to be able to tell you when the leaves are likely to first break forth, what week that's going to happen, at what elevation. I'm watching for flowers, and I have I know that this valley is going to go before that valley. And this elevation is going to go in August, and this area is going to go in early June, and this one's going to go in May. And so I'm watching, and I know where everything's supposed to happen. Nature doesn't always follow my, the plans of what I did in the past. But it's something we keep up with, and the autumn leaves, and knowing, like, okay, here's what's likely to happen each week. So you have all those elements, but then the real challenge is trying to bring those together. 
And so I spend a lot of my time pre-visualizing, yeah, trying to imagine. I, I say, OK, um, every February, I sit down and start making a list. Because March 1st, we have to get our uh, accounting permits. Thank you, Karen. Um, and so I need to sort of figure out what my plan is for the, um, for the summer. And so I, I sit down and think, OK, what do I need? I'm working on this book right now. And this area is a bit short. I need some more photos of this particular area of the Mummy Range. And I think, OK, that scene there, we're looking at uh, you know, Long Lake or something. When is the vegetation going to be right? OK, it's going to be in these couple of weeks. And will the light be shining from? Oh, boy, that doesn't work so well. So let me think, if, how can we compromise? And, you know, and, and then starting to figure out in my head what, what these pictures I want to look at like is oftentimes the way I start. And I end up coming up with a big list of um, first week of June, here are the places I want to get to. Second week of June, here are the places I want to get to. Third week of June. Or at least they're the places that I think have the potential to be at their best during those weeks. And every year I kind of change it up and find new places and new vantage points. Um, but that was all the easy part of figuring out the vegetation, the light, the wet, you know, roughly what the weather might be. Now actually trying to achieve it, what you have in your head, that's where it gets challenging. Um, it doesn't, you know, it's not leaning out a car window. Um, when I go out, when I have one of these things in mind, uh, I start watching weather forecasts uh, as we get closer to that week and trying to know what day things are going to be at. And it's funny, my wife is looking at the weather all the time. And then she, uh, and I look at the weather, and we look at it completely differently. She's wanting to know what the temperature is so, so she knows what to wear. I don't even pay attention to temperature, generally, unless we're near the frost areas. But I'm watching um, where will the piles be? And what time of day are they going to build? And where are they likely to build? And uh, what, how strong will the moon be? Will I be able to get reflections? Will the leaves and plants be uh, still or will they be migrating all over? Um, and so I'm watching the weather and then I think, OK, Wednesday, it looks like I'm going to have the best shot at this remote spot. Let me do it. So then it's going out to try and see if I can achieve it. Now, many of these places are, have a really limited period of time where I can get something. I don't know if you can see, those of you who can look, they've got a star picture back there. That was this last June. That took me a number of years to try and capture. And you think, oh, well, what's so hard about that? Um, well, there's a certain, only certain times when the Milky Way is sort of behind logs and meeker. Now, if I was painting, I would paint it right between the two of them, not with the maker and that. But I kind of works with a few other issues. So you've got to get the Milky Way roughly in the right spot. You have to match your composition. But then you also, um, if you're going to show the mountains at all and not just have them be a silhouette, you need some light for them as well. So I need some moonlight. But if I get too much moonlight, you no longer get to see the stars anymore. If I don't get enough, you don't get to see the mountains very well. And so I'm looking for just a sliver of moon to be rising, and it can't be there or there. It's got to be behind, behind me in the east. And so we're figuring out, oh, I've got a two and a half, three-day window in June. I can do this. So i got to go up there. And so I've got to walk during those days, and there will be clouds on the eastern horizon. And you go, OK, I got up here at two. There are clouds. I'll wait. Nope. Didn't happen this morning. Back down and go to bed. Uh, and then you come, then you lose your couple of days. You wait till the next year you try again. And the next year the wind is howling so bad you can't keep your tripod steady. And you go, okay, we'll try it again next year. <laughs> and uh, you know, I have one picture. Um, it's at this beautiful remote lake. Uh, it's about, it's actually almost exactly 10 mile hike into the lake. And it's, just, it's at about 1,200 feet, so it's up above the tree line. And uh, in the summer, uh, usually the first week of August, it's just filled with wildflowers and these jagged mountains behind. And so I've had this picture in my head of getting these wildflowers in the foreground, a still mountain lake, um, uh, these jagged peaks perfectly reflecting in the water, and puffy clouds flying overhead. 
Uh, you know, I've got it all. I know exactly what I want. If I could paint, I would do it. <laughs> I can't. I can't barely do it. You already saw my name. Uh, and so I worked on this picture for a couple of years. Uh, on the 14th year, I got pretty close. Good enough to print it, at least. But on that day, I still had high winds, and I found a small corner of the lake that was sheltered and had a bit of reflection, and that the flowers weren't moving too much. But it took 14 years of, of trying, and I go back, and, you know, and for a hike like that, 10 miles, it's a three-hour hike, minus a 20-minute drive, minus 20 minutes to get up and have breakfast and get, get dressed and get in the car. So I'm leaving at 1 o'clock in the morning to get there by 5. So I set my composition before the light crests the horizon and maybe hits the mountaintops at about 5.20 a.m. So, you know, and so I'm watching all of this and I've got all these pictures in my head that I want to get out and I want to, um, but I can't find them. I can't make them happen. Uh, but there are challenges sometimes in, in taking pictures like that. It's not just not having it work. Sometimes you have bad weather. Um, you know, I have this little picture here. Uh, this is up on top of, between Flat Top and Hallett's Peak uh, in Rocky Mountain National Park uh, in mid-February. And I hiked up there, oh, and I, I made a mistake. I arrived faster than, it kept me warm hiking fast, but I arrived about 45 minutes too soon. And the winds were howling. Uh, I don't know if you can see, this is a sign and it says, you know, do not descend dangerous glacier, you know, just on the other side. Uh, it's Timber Glacier. And it's covered in rime ice. It's super cool water that flies through the air, and whenever it touches something, it instantly freezes into ice. And so I get covered in ice, but uh, the sign's covered in ice, the rocks are covered in ice. But uh, I get up there, and the wind's just howling, and so I got 45 minutes until the light is low enough that I can get some warm light and I didn't know if the clouds would even part to let it through but I thought I gotta wait and so uh, I hung up behind the boulder uh, for 45 minutes trying to dance and stay warm you know but uh, that's a regular part of my life I do that a lot um, I do jumping jacks I'm hopping on me here at 2 a.m. you know or whatever it takes um, what else do we have I've been in fit in Crazy blizzards where all of a sudden you can't see anything um, out in the park. I've been holding my tripods as best as I can, trying not to get blown over my cell phone my tripod and somehow come out with a clear picture. I got stuck in the park where they closed it on me because there's so much snow and uh, don't want anyone in or out. And I'm out there having a blast, actually, in the crazy <laughs> snow. I've been stuck in the tundra, you know, numerous times. I should be smarter than this. I'm always watching the weather, but sometimes the weather doesn't do what you think it's going to do or what it says it's supposed to do. <clears throat> I've been stuck on the lightning storms, and if you've ever been stuck in a lightning storm on, in the tundra, there's nowhere to hide. There, you, you know, you've got bullets coming down. It makes for great photographs, but it's not worth it. But uh, I've got some too. I remember lightning, uh, photographs taken during those conditions, but I, you take them quickly and then run as fast as you can to get out there. Um, you know, I've been stuck in fog up in the tundra. I lost my way just because I'm in the middle of the tundra, not on the trail, way out, and the fog rolls in, and you have no, nothing to tell where you are. It's just, I actually enjoy that. I think that's kind of fun. Because I know as soon as it lifts, you'll be, ah, oh, this is where I am. Gotcha. Um, well, one of the things about getting photos like this, for me at least, is uh, I hide a lot at night. In fact, I can see I've hiked nearly every trail in Rocky Mountain National Park in the, in the dark at night. Um, and I love it. Um, I, the hardest part is getting out of bed, usually. That's our, or getting to bed late. I like it in my bed. But uh, as you hike at night, you just have this little bubble around you. And that's all you see. You can't see what's ahead. You can't see what's behind. You can't see what's in the trees. And uh, so I can just go into my own zone and just relax as I hike up the trail and uh, think and pray and uh, just be at peace. Those nights are special. You don't run into too many people out there in the middle of the night. I mean, I did one night. I remember I was, uh, 
I hiked back again, this is about 10 miles uh, for sunset, photograph this location, and on this trail, I always get nervous because, I'll tell you a little bit later, but yeah, uh, running with various creatures, but I come marching down this trail and I see wet tennis shoe prints in the sand on the trail, I think, and their right mind is out here at this time. <laughs> so I start racing up as quick as I can. I think, God, maybe it's a fellow photographer, somebody I know. And I, eventually I come out of the corner and I see this guy looking at a map with a headlamp. And I said, hey, how are you doing? And he just about hit me. He flew away up. Uh, he's a young guy who'd been camping, first time ever camping. And uh, he had uh, uh, lions come into his uh, campsite. And he was just so freaked out. I said, let's go back. I'll, I'll go back with you and we'll, we'll figure it out. And we'll scare him away. And I'm not going back. Never going back. <laughs> what about your stop? I'm not going back. <laughs> OK, come on. And so we took him down to the uh, trailhead. And, he, and we called him the ranger. We met him. And, uh, but, um, yeah, but mostly that night hiking is actually one of my favorite things. I really enjoy it. And then be somewhere as the sun rises or seeing that last sunset when it's just glorious. And you look around and you think, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. Where is everybody? Oh, yeah, that's right. They went on at 3 o'clock. Uh, get ready for dinner and uh, you're missing the whole show. Um, yeah. Actually, I, a few weeks ago, I, Oh, it was a little out of August. I took my son, uh, he's 18 now, and trained to be a wildland firefighter. And I took him up uh, into the never summers uh, for sunrise. We got way up on top. I think we left at midnight. And he was so exhausted. He got up, he laid out on the boulders and went sound asleep. He was angry as could be at me because I woke him up saying, Look at the sunrise! Come <laughs> in! I'm sleeping! <laughs> Um, what else? Yeah, the hardest thing about being a nature photographer, I've only mentioned like four times, lack of sleep. Um, you know, usually carrying a 30 to 40 pound pack uh, most of the time. Um, and when I hike without it, it just feels like I'm free. It's amazing. Um, injuries, you get a few of those. I went into the dermatologist uh, just two weeks ago. And they, they do the body check for moles or anything. And they looked at me and said, what are you doing? Because I had cuts and scrapes everywhere. But because, uh, you know, to get to a lot of places I'm trying to get to, you know, like yesterday, I probably climbed over a thousand dead trees and under it's probably a hundred of them, you know, trying to get to places out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, yeah, you get a lot of cuts and scrapes, but that's, that's not so bad. The worst I ever had, I think, was uh, um, middle of the winter. I was up on Trail Ridge Road um, at night. I shot sunset, I think, in a rock cut or something. And was walking down, and, I, and in the winter, the wind blows, and so you have patches of snow on the road and patches of open road. And I got, oh, good, I got a good stretch of open road uh, near the huge crossing, if you know where that is. And as I'm walking down, I hit a patch of uh, ice that I couldn't see at night and tore a ligament. And then I started, I realized I would do this, it was bad. And I thought, oh no, this is not good. And I have sworn to myself I will never be saved by a ranger out there. I go to an that would be too embarrassing. So I, I, I made my way down, but it took a good chunk of the night crawling down through some deep snow. But, uh, and about two days later, my wife kindly encouraged me to get a satellite tracking device so she could see exactly where I was. And uh, so nowadays, and that was in like 2006 or seven. And so for all these years, I travel always with a satellite tracking device uh, that I can also send text over if I need to. It has a 911 button if I need to. And I always, always, always tell someone where I'm going and when I'll return you know, so if there was any issue, and I take a lot of other safety precautions as well, because I am not interested in getting myself in trouble. I want to enjoy building this as much as I can, while being as responsible as I know how to be, but uh, I still enjoy that silence and solitude. So why in the world do I do this? Why, why, do, I, why, do, why do I and other photographers go out to these crazy places and do crazy things to get these photos? Well, there are several reasons, and for me at least, the first one would be 
I want to bring people's attention to our natural world. All of us spend our lives involved in just our daily happenings. We've got things going on with work, with uh, family, with just life. It, it, it consumes us, and which is, is normal. But I kind of want to say, hey, we're part of this incredible natural world, and it's in crisis right now. I was just looking, and in my lifetime, I was noticing that um, we have lost 69% of the wildlife on our planet during, during my life alone. We've lost 79, or 83% of the freshwater populations. We've seen our insect populations plummet. You know, we have seen so many different crises in our world. Things are, in many ways, collapsing. Almost, in a sense, our world is almost dying, in a way, right before our eyes. And I want to just kind of use my photography to say, pay attention to the natural world. It needs us right now. Well, maybe it doesn't need us, but uh, maybe it needs us not to do a lot of what we're doing. But so I is to bring attention to the current crisis that we're in, and for us to all live a little bit more carefully, in, not just in recycling, but standing up to preserve and protect these special places we have left, but uphold all the ecosystems that are in crisis right now. I, mean, I don't know if you heard about the Alaska crab issue this year. They had to cancel the whole season because they lost them. They dropped by 90 percent. They don't know where they're going. What's happened? And we're seeing things happen all across our globe. And it's easier just to kind of ignore them. But I, you know, my plea for my philosophy is pay attention to them. The other, one of the other reasons I'm doing is because it's healing for me. I spent decades working in that rough areas, and I find that nature is healing. But not just for me. It's for all of us. And uh, we all have difficulties and troubles in our life, things that are weighing us down. And interestingly, nature offers a healing to us. Another, you know, we've all seen the studies that are out there about uh, how it reduces stress, you know, how it does this or that. They've even done studies where they see how it makes people better neighbors. It makes people more generous and more uh, kind to one another. It's, it's bizarre. But I think what's happening is that when we go out into the natural world, it causes us to slow down. It causes us to be quiet. It causes us to, it gives us an opportunity to confront all the things happening under the surface of our lives. We all tend to live on the surface, dealing with whatever's happening right now and, and not paying attention to what's going on deep inside. And an extended time in the natural world gives us an opportunity to start to work through those things. And people come back from vacations in the natural world quite often say, my whole perspective on life has changed. I finally recognize what's important. And it's a gift that nature gives us. And I want to share that gift with, uh, with those who need it. And uh, I want my photography to be healing in the same way that it heals for me. But at the same time, I hope that all of us will, will do what we can for nature at the same time. Well, tonight, I'm going to stop talking a little bit for questions in a minute. But before I do, I'm going to mention I've got some of my books over on the table there. You can have a look through them. If you're interested in buying them, they're in the, you can get them from the gift shop. Um, I've got two books on some of my personal reflections, which are sort of why I was going to the end there. And uh, I've got Hiking Down to Rocky Mountain National Park, coffee table books and calendars, uh, a few different things up there. Have a look. And I'm happy to sign those. I also want to say I sent out some documentation on an organization I helped start called Nature First, if you're a photographer and uh, are passionate about caring for the natural world, have it, check it out. We're in 70 nations right now and have thousands of people around the world actively working for uh, using their photography to help care for our natural world. And uh, if you're planning a trip to Rocky Mountain National Park, I recently started a new website called RockyMountainNationalPark.com that you may want to check out. But uh, I'm going to stop talking and see if anyone has any questions. Yes. Um, your work's very nice. It's, it's beautiful. And I noticed that your name and Jim's names are on almost everything. What's the purpose of both your Well, I think it's just the way that they put the tags together. If you look down 
the bottom it talks, it has the name of the show. James Disney, Eric Stenson at the top. This is Eric Stenson above the title, and this one will say James Disney above the title. Thank you. So his stuff is pretty easy. Another secret, I only told one of the kids when they had to figure it out. Are there ones with this frame or mine? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's a question I have. I love the way you frame them. Is that something that you thought of, or someone that you took it to a shop and they? I have a company I work with, and uh, so we, we do a lot of different framing styles, and we decided to keep it uniform for this. But it's a nice, nice style. The uh, pictures pop right off. And so you can change them out seasonally and uh, have your spring and summer and you know, in your one spot. And only Eric's allowed to do that. No one else is allowed to do that. <laughs> 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 You know, I moved 18 times before I was 18. And uh, then I've moved many times, moved in many countries since then. Um, I was born in Minnesota, if that helps. <laughs> it's a start. It's a start. Uh, and, yeah, lived in Washington State, in Montana, and all over, and lived all over, all over the world, including Austria. So since I said Austria, you know, my friend from Austria here, I'll have you ask the next question. Yeah, you, um, you do mention how you try to uh, learn underwater photography. <laughs> I was wondering how many cameras have you trashed since then? Uh, Bill is an amazing photographer. If you get a chance to meet Bill or check out his photography, please do. And then we have another amazing photographer back here, too, Paige Fulton. We'll introduce you to her later. She's impressive. Uh, but Bill is referring, asking how many cameras I've trashed over the years, and it's been quite a few. What happened back in 2005, I was photographing up in Bridal Vale Falls, if for those of you who know it, Rocky Mountain National Park. I slipped, I fell, I lost my camera into the waterfalls. It didn't work out yet, and I had no money at that time. I had nothing. I, I didn't know how it was going. Yeah, just daily survival was uh, tough. In fact, when we would go to McDonald's, we would each choose two things from the dollar menu. That's where we were at at that point. And so I thought, well, I've done the photography. That's, that's it. It's over. And uh, friends from two different forms, a camera form that Bill's part of, and a uh, Rocky Mountain National Park form, they got together, saved up money, and purchased a new camera for me. Together with snorkels and... <laughs> And, uh, and instructions never to go near the water again. <laughs> um, and since then, I have only brought out one in the Pacific Ocean. No, that was the Atlantic Ocean, that was England. And I lost, lost another one last year. I'm not sure how. We said water damage again, but I don't know how. <laughs> Maybe it was an ice one, but I'm not sure. So, and, yes, sir. You mentioned your, uh, your wife and your, your children. I just managed how, how, the one how you the word life balance. Did you keep up with some of your family life to do this? Should I answer that or should I have you with my wife answer? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to answer tonight. <laughs> Not intentionally. Um, you know, it was really hard during those first years. The, the nice thing is that much of the photography, especially in Rocky Mountain National Park, is I name my overall business morning light photography because it mostly happens in the morning. So I can go out at one in the morning and be back by you know eight or so and uh, be around somewhat. But it's been it's always a challenge. And uh, we you know I chose to take one day off a week and the camera doesn't get out. That's one of the best sunrises happening. <laughs> always, but that's my like, yeah, idea. Just it, it, I'm with family. Um, but it's always a challenge, and I think that's true of any work. But the truth is, most of the job of a full-time photographer is 85% is my guess, is spent inside an office, because you don't actually make your living from taking photographs. You make it selling books and selling prints, and, and so I spend most of my time doing administrative work. But, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. If we were getting uh, <coughs> prepared to take a shot, you're so in awe of what's in front of you that you missed the shot. I have been, he asked if I ever get to a shot that's so incredible 
that I, I'm distracted and, and don't get the shot. There have been many times where I have been so in awe and I bump the camera tripod and it, I, I come away with a blurry image or I forget to do this or that many, many, many times. And so I, I, I am trying to just stay focused, get the image and then let go and, and ooh and all. But yeah, it's so easy, because there's so many little things you got like, okay, wait, the wind is now blowing, and there's a little bit of vegetation that's all moving, and I wasn't paying attention to that, and I was looking at, yeah, it, I, I've messed up more times than I could possibly count. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, your photography is exceptional. I mean, it's, it's, um, so um, the question I have is, have you ever used film? Yes. And do you still use film? Yeah, you know, have I used film? And I did during the early days of my photography. Uh, I used 4x5, you know, the wooden camera with all the controls. I felt like I would be, that would give me the highest quality image, and then digital quickly zoomed up there. And so I moved to digital, and I'm actually very happy with digital. Um, a lot of people these days are returning to film because they like the process, they like the uh, the whole the whole approach. And for me, I'm not a real fan necessarily of equipment or of the process. I love nature, and uh, I find that the digital cameras give me the quality I need. And when I take a picture like on my 4 by 5 you know, it's a huge process. I can't have any wind. It's it's really finicky. Everything has to be right. Take the picture. That's five bucks or more, and then I have to send it off to a place. Wait, they develop it. Then I get it back, and then I find out if it's any good. And if it is good, then I have to send it back and have a drum scan made. And uh, with digital, I can take a picture early in the morning, up on top of the peak, be back, post an image on summer, uh, on Facebook for you know everyone to see and uh, work and having prints on it by the end of the week and so it's a but i have many friends who love the old school approach and i'm just not one of those who love the approach but uh, yeah you have some spectacular photographs i'm looking at that one there do you ever go back and try to get something do. Oh, I, do I go back again to places that I already have decent photographs of? All the time. I'm always thinking I can improve this, but sometimes I do, and sometimes the weather just doesn't cooperate. But yeah, I, you know, because it's a learning. You keep growing and doing things a little better every year, but you can never replicate weather conditions, and that's the challenge. So, yeah, hey. You know, um, yeah, I, I used to just do a map and compass, um, and I remember one night I was I, I was camping in this deep forest, um, and I had to return after sunset, and I mean just impossible, just trying to find this place in deep forest. And I had my compass, and I just stood there thinking this is wrong, and the compass map actually flipped polarization. Oh, I don't know what it brought up against, but it was pointing south. And I just thought, trying. Everything, in, everything I've ever read says trust the compass, but everything inside would say, don't you do <laughs> So after that, I haven't used compasses as much, and I've relied more on the, uh, uh, if I'm in a situation like that, I'm not using various tools on my phone, but I always have a map and compass with me because it, battery on the phone is going to die on me. I can't trust it long term. And then some of the new apps are pretty good to get me. And so, but I find oftentimes I memorize sort of the route I need to go and I know, okay, the mountain's going to be on the left, so you're going to have the slope. And when I get to the stream, turn left. And so I oftentimes have the routes memorized, but if I need to, I'll pull out my phone. So, any other questions? Yeah. Um, so many, I would say most photographs are edited, digital photographs are edited after in the computer, some even manipulated. Yeah. And all the way up to CGI, where the computer is generating image, for you, there's the line between 
this is a photograph, and this is yeah. Well, I, first, I try not to judge other people's photographs, um, and, and that's that's a constant discussion in the world of nature photography. The question is, how much do I edit my photos? And everyone draws that line in a different place. Um, and, and the crazy thing is, there are now apps coming out that you can actually just type in your vision. You know, a long house below, Long's Peak, surrounded by wildflowers, and then you know it pops up and you go, whoa, you know, I didn't have a job. Um, <laughs> but for me, what I want to do is I want to convey that sense that you were there with me. Uh, and I don't always succeed, but I, I you know, did it look different than this? Not much. You know, if you were there, you would have said, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I saw. Um, we all see things differently, and when I say this looks pretty natural, someone else may say, ah, oh, that looks pretty artificial or vice versa. And so my goal is always to transport you to what I've actually seen, what's actually there. Because I don't want to change out a sky. I don't want to uh, stretch a mountain and make it different. I want, when you go to that same place, that you stand there and go, wow, this is an amazing place. And I go, Huh, it looks so much better than the picture. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, because my goal is to be a follow up. But yeah, there is something I have to think about. It's mostly the Lightroom, and Lightroom is a tool which, uh, at least until last week, you know, you couldn't uh, change out objects or, you know, you start with the raw materials and you can adjust the contrast and the saturation and the things like that. And so, my goal is, if you were with me, that you would say, yeah, that was pretty close to what I saw. Anyone else have a question? Yeah, I have another one. So, I thought this was John McGowan. Thank you. How exactly did you shoot this? Uh, I mean, I, I see a lot of like darkness, a lot of shadows, but then also I see a lot of light uh, in the forefront. So, uh, did you use a flash? No, 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 this is just, if, in, imagine standing out on top of a flat top mountain, tower peak here, and you've got thick clouds, and at the base of the clouds is a crack, and the sun is peeking through just as before it sets, lighting all this up nice. for about uh, two yeah, minutes. That's yeah, it's natural. So for two minutes, and then it goes dark, and then it gets cold. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So you have a whole book on hiking. Um, where do you have to get it? Yeah, okay. Well, and this book. The uh, Rocky Mountain Conservancy asked me to write it because we've got five million tourists coming to Rocky Mountain National Park and they wanted to know where can we send them to give them the best experience on an official trail. Um, and, uh, you know, because uh, you can't have five million people tramping out everywhere in the wilderness, you know, trouble. But of all the ones in the book, the one that is my favorite is probably Lake Anita. You get there and you think, I never want to leave. I'm, I'm happy to stay here like many of them. Um, and you can either start at Bear Lake or you can start at Grand Lake. Um, it's about, um, I think it's, it's about 13 miles each way. But there's rarely anyone there. And you have this gorgeous mountain right high up on the shelf. And uh, it's got a little island part way out. And, uh, just this dramatic view of Andrew's Peak over the top of it, and it's just the sense of peace and stillness and wilderness and wild and um, trying to get there for sunset. That's the best time to be there. So, that's a All right, I'm going to do uh, two more minutes, okay, two only minutes. because we will have about 45 minutes for book signing. Yep. And you guys can ask questions as he's signing books too. So, I'll try <laughs> but we'll do two more minutes. So, okay. Uh, all the times you've gone up, you haven't mentioned encounters with animals. Well, did I not? I didn't answer, answer the counter, but I just had that in here, and I didn't catch it. Okay, I'd run to mountain lions in the middle of the night. Um, that's no fun. They ran away. Eventually, I had like 10 minutes of trying to scare them, and they just looked at me and eventually wandered off. Uh, another animal that I encountered the most that really scares me out there are moose. And I hiked and, and come through the night, come out on the trail, and come like three feet away from the face of the moose with my headlamp lighting up their big blue, his eyes are blue when lit by headlamps. Um, you know, staring right at me, and then 
all of us shocked, not sure what's going on, and I managed to get away before you charged me. But I have been charged a number of times. Uh, I once was staying at uh, Rock, Little Rock Lake in the park and walked over a little ridge and there was a big big moose standing there and she was not happy when she saw me invade her space and I wasn't too happy to be there. And she starts running after me. So I ran into the trees and start running around the trees knowing that they're not real nimble and don't have the greatest eyesight and eventually she left me alone. I went back to camp and thought I would take a nap until later in the afternoon and uh, I wake up and look out the tent and there she is standing there looking at my tent. <laughs> this is not possible. I didn't sleep well that night. I had another experience standing out in the middle of an open meadow and photographed a moose way far away. I had a 600 millimeter lens and I looked through the lens and thought, it's getting closer, great. I look up and she's charging right at me. And I look around, there are no trees to hide behind. So I just had to stay on my ground. And uh, fortunately, she stopped just a few feet away from me. But uh, well, I might have a few, but uh, anyways, I'm going to stop talking. There's a lot more I could ask. Just one question. Did you and Jim, did you hike together? Or? We did not hike together. We just sat in there. And I unfortunately only knew Jim the last 10 years or so which is a real shame. But, uh, anyway, I would love to answer all of your questions, but they told me I've got to wrap up. But thank you so much. Please check out the books. Come, I'll happily sign or answer any questions. And uh, really appreciate all of you coming out tonight and your great support. Uh, thank you.